What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference with some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders, including Bernie and his team. And our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. Today, I'm very excited. We have Bernie Thompson. He's founder of Efficient Era and Pluggable Technologies. And Pluggable Technologies is a top worldwide brand. We'll talk about the worldwide part for USB, Bluetooth, and charging devices. Efficient Era takes a software developed that helped Pluggable become one of the largest private label electronic sellers on Amazon, took it to the masses so they can use it too. He's worked as a programmer for IBM, a software manager at Microsoft, and much more. And he is author of Flywheels and Feedback Loops, and it's a guide to success for Amazon private label sellers. Bernie, thanks for powering through the cold. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me on, Jeremy. This is awesome. I'm excited. And so much to talk about, you know, because you kind of saw the landscape of online early on, right? So go back to that point, IBM early on. So what was it like at IBM and what was the landscape like of technology? You know, I, I started at IBM in the 1990s, early 90s, and, uh, you know, it was still a phase where if you were a relatively a, a, an individual or a small company, uh, you really could not think about creating your own products and selling them globally. Uh, really tough to do, required a lot of resources. So it's pretty cool. I mean, the, the point where we're at what right was now, on the a web, lot has changed. Like at that point. <laughs> well, you know, actually, uh, it's interesting. I um, I was involved with Linux also in the very early days, yeah. and actually ran a web server uh, when I was at college at Penn State in 1992, running a very early version of Linux pre 1.0, and uh, wrote an article for Linux Journal about the World Wide Web. What did it's you so say? funny go? Well, that should so be funny in the, this book. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it's just like there's this thing. It's the web. You know, you can talk about anything. It's it's better than Gopher. Uh, you know, you can document stuff. You can uh, you know. So so it's it's a very kind of naive. Uh, wow, there's this thing called the web thing. Right. And uh, what's funny is is even to you know pretty geeky audience like the uh, Linux Journal audience that that naivety was actually you know the right uh, the right approach at that time. People were not yet using the web. There was. Uh, you, know, you should of, dust it, that off. I would love for you to post that as a blog post on Efficient Era to see this is what the landscape was like. Then. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, I'll, 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 I can send out a link in the resources here if you want to go back and read an article about the web from 1990s. So you were surfing. What was on the web? Like what, what websites did you come across? <laughs> Well, you know, I had put up my own web server actually about Penn, about Penn State and Linux mm -hmm. uh, at the time, which is where I was going. Um, you know, it was a lot of technical resources. It really was a bunch of geeks up there. Uh, you had the beginnings of the Usenet groups, um, which now have you know long since died off, yeah. but that was a very vibrant discussion community. Yeah. Um, every university and every company had kind of a proto page up. It was usually for the companies. It mm -hmm. was kind of their R and D groups, uh, not yeah. usually the marketing people weren't involved yet. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, but there was quite a bit up there, but, but it, it was just at that point evolving from purely a university research network, you know, really ARPANET, um, to the kind of internet that, that we all take for granted today. Yeah. And we'll talk about it cause you have a global perspective. Maybe it comes from, you know, with IBM and Microsoft and maybe just your experience with pluggable. So we'll talk about, you know, the strategy to sell globally, but if people listen to the end, they will hear, um, why and how Bernie climbed Mount St. Helen in a floral dress, but we'll talk about it at the very end. Um, I have a note to talk about that. So strategy to sell globally. 
Yeah. So what should pe- what did you do at Pluggable, and what should people be doing now for their own brand? Well, you know, so the the first thing to note is that that Pluggable was always an electronics company first, and an Amazon seller second. You know, I, I think there's a very vibrant community of, of sellers out there who, you know, they work for the man, and they and they want their financial freedom, and they want to do something on their own, uh, and and it's awesome for that. Um, you know, it, it's it's been a good few years for that, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for that uh, that remains. Um, but it's also an awesome place for somebody who really, uh, you know, is interested and has ex- has some amount of expertise in a certain set of products, has some uh, ability to go get those manufactured um, to reach a worldwide audience. And that's what we've done with Pluggable, which is an electronics company. Um, you know, I think that uh, the parts that Amazon uh, solves for you is you don't need to hire salespeople over in France and Germany. Um, you don't need to hire a logistics team, yeah. uh, you know, over in the UK or in Japan. Um, what you do need to do is, uh, you know, set up a bunch of processes so that you can handle shipping your goods to Amazon warehouses in other countries. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that you can set up processes for translation, uh, both initially of your product listings and ongoing customer support. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, unfortunately, you know, there's things we got to deal with. Uh, you you've got to dive into a bunch of tax and regulatory issues. Um, you know, unfortunately, Amazon can't make those just go away, and and they're often the key gating factor uh, for a lot of things that you do the internationally. Taxes. They are, yeah. yeah. Uh, you How know, do so you navigate that? Do you have to hire an expert or do you just learn it? Does your team learn it eventually? You know, it's funny. I'd love to say just hire an expert because usually that's the right thing. But the fact is, is that tax experts are so in demand and so hard to reach and, and the stuff is so complicated and a lot of it's Amazon specific um, that we've had a hard time finding uh, tax experts who could give us good advice. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that, you know, who either you as the business owner or, or somebody that you trust needs to do at least some amount of research and some amount of decision making. And a lot of times that's the last um, kind of gate for us to go or no go on a certain selling in a certain spot in the world. Is that because the, um, you factor in if it's it's not going to return your investment because of the tax is too high? Is that is that a deciding factor? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Or the complexity of setup. You know, like today, uh, pluggable our electronics, we sell them throughout North America. So yeah. the United States, Canada, Mexico, we sell them throughout Europe. Uh, so the prime Amazon markets of UK, France, uh, Germany, Spain, uh, and we export from the UK and Germany to the rest of Europe. However, um, we don't currently sell in Italy, uh, and it's because Italy has kind of a history of being pretty brutal to uh, foreign corporations in terms of their uh, their VAT rules. Uh, mm. Primarily, you're interacting over a, a type of sales tax in Europe called VAT tax. We also don't sell, we sell in Japan, but we do not sell in China and India. Uh, China is a whole set of issues, but a lot of them are tax. Um, India is uh, a whole set of issues, including you have to set up a company in India. That company needs to have um, Indian citizens who are resident directors of that company. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're currently selling in Mexico, but uh, when you order our product from Mexico, we're actually shipping from the U.S. That's because of regulatory requirements where we'd have to register as a company in Mexico, be mm. filing tax, tax returns there. So, so there's really a lot to navigate. You look pretty calm a, considering all this stuff. <laughs> well, you know, it's because we choose to say no sometimes. And so I, I think that's actually an important lesson. I mean, I think that you, uh, you know, the first message is you can go global and lots of people do and have with Amazon. Uh, but but the, the second sub message below that is I think to really be successful and to keep at least a little bit of brown hair um, you've got to say no to certain things. You've got to look at the complexity and say, yep. um, you know, we're just not big enough or we don't have the, the uh, legal or financial resources yet. Uh, you know, we're going to let that let that market go. So what order go. should people go in? Like, let's say they're just in the U.S. Where should they start to branch out for a second, third? Yeah, that's a good question. I think. Um, you know, Canada required uh, uh, an external registration uh, to, to import in there. Um, 
you know, it, it has been that, and, and in order to go to Europe, you got to get VAT registered in at least one country, typically the country you're importing into, which to date has been the UK. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, also the, the thing about tax and regulatory is it shifts all the time. And the uh, Brexit in the UK, the UK splitting off from the EU, uh, could really change what companies like I mean, we're, we may have to do a bunch of stuff and, and for new people coming in, it may change the path. But, you know, if you're going to do it today, I would probably say uh, get VAT registered in the UK, uh, begin filing VAT tax returns there. Um, and then that gives you a gateway to mm. all of Europe. And basically the way the European VAT system works is you don't need to file any other places until you cross what's called a distance selling threshold in other countries which it varies per country, but it's generally the lowest numbers are around 30 to 35,000 euros um, per annually, per calendar annual year. Um, so, you know, when you're getting started, you know, it'd be great to hit that number, right? So, so you can just kind of get in through one country, sell throughout Europe, uh, and then, you know, it allows you to kind of take on the, the tax complexity slowly as your sales actually, you know, hit some significant numbers. Now, for electronics, so, I mean, Canada, UK, would it vary for other categories or would you see any differences? What would you recommend? Maybe, I don't know, if you take a couple examples, um, where would that change where you wouldn't recommend Canada and UK? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think... Um, Is that pretty standard? You know, the, yeah, the the other reason why Canada and UK are good is, is of course, you know, you're you're not stepping over language barriers quite yet. Although, yeah. if you're using the UK as a gateway to the rest of Europe, you are. Um, but um, yeah, I think the you know there are certain categories where it's just trickier. Um, anything in health and beauty or food, um, you're really you know tax tax is not your biggest regulatory issue. It's the health and safety regulatory. Uh, and it's it's pretty tough. I mean, uh, I you know basically if you're in certain health and beauty categories, um, you've got to be looking at sourcing differently as you begin selling differently. Mm -hmm. You know, in each geography. With electronics, it's not quite that way. You can pretty much source globally. You know, w w through one uh, supply chain and then sell globally. So, what's been the biggest challenge besides the tax component? What's been the biggest challenge of of going global? Um, you know, I think it's that, um, you know, you really need to have your, your, uh, your logistics down. Um, Amazon's this, this great mechanism, you know, for small companies to sell globally, but you never know quite what you're going to get in terms of results. Right. Uh, you know, if, if I look across our product line right now and look at what are the top sellers in the U.S., what are the top sellers in Japan, what are the top sellers in Germany, you know, there's some common elements. But it's fairly random, uh, you know, which products are going to be the ones that kind of get the flywheel. Really, spinning. it is random. It's somewhat random, you know, and I think it's based on uh, luck, competitive factors, uh, you know, the flapping of the of the butterfly wings. What's one you know, that surprised I, you? Oh, let's see. One that surprised us. Well, you know, we we. Um, we sell this very simple USB audio adapter. Um, you know, it's a kind of product that's been around for 20 years. Uh, and uh, it just took off like wildfire in certain markets. I think that was one of the ones that had really taken off in Japan. You would have thought that the product like that was already well covered. Um, yeah. But but uh, but in fact, uh, you know, it turned out that there was something about what we were offering. And, and I don't, honestly don't know what it, what it was. I mean, I think that... <laughs> I think it was a little bit of a forgotten category and people were actually hunting around for that product. So, but, but it was also geography specific. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these other geographies have the benefit that they, they, if you look across all the Amazon geographies, the U S gets all the products. Yeah. Basically it's, it's perfectly competitive. Everybody who is anybody is selling in the U S yeah. that's not necessarily true for the other geographies. You get a little bit sheltered as, you know, as you go into Canada, you're talking about a, an Amazon market that is somewhere between one twentieth and one tenth the size of the U S market, but there's a lot less competition. So, right. you know, you can easily have a situation where you're selling a lot more as the number one seller on Canada than you are as the number 12 seller. Right. In the US. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. So what does a product release look like for you? Like, do you test market it in one country and, and expand? How does that work? 
Yeah, we, we do a little bit of that. We, if a product can't be successful in the U.S. for us, it's probably you know not a success overall. Really? So, the, you know, there are products that we uh, do essentially test in the U.S. We launch U.S. only first, uh, especially products that do require customization for other geographies. Uh, a lot of our products, electronics, docking stations, chargers, they have power adapters. Mm. Well, plugs are different globally, so we, right. we in fact have to do different SKUs. Right. You know, for for Europe and in the UK and and uh, you know than than our US plugs, so very often we'll sell it first in the US, verify that we've got a product that that is compelling here in the US, and then we'll expand it to the other geographies. Um, but yeah, you know, our launch process is, um, you know, we we're lean. Um, you know, like everybody who's who's sharp at this stuff, we. Um, try to order the minimum amount possible so that we're putting the least amount of, of money at risk Capital, with each yeah. product launch. Um, you know, that can be hard to do when you're doing products that are that are unique like ours. Um, you know, and then we, you know, just try to be lean about uh, how much we stock, but also, um, you know, more aggressive than, than um, you might think. Okay, so, so I say lean on one hand, but on the other hand, um, you know, this is kind of jumping topics a little yeah, bit, but you know, another option that you have is to sell as a vendor to Amazon, um, mm. where, you know, it's more of a traditional relationship where you're wholesaling the products to Amazon and they yeah. sell it. Well, there, it turns out there's a whole bunch of problems with that, at least today. Uh, and one of them is when Amazon does their algorithms about, uh, how much stock to keep for products, um, they, they don't account for the winners. They, they often, I, I've, I've talked to a lot of sellers who've gone that way and their products are constantly going out of stock because Amazon, they're, they're more risk averse than you. They don't want to buy a bunch of your product and have it be sitting on the shelves. So they're very lean about placing their orders, leaner than you would be. So, so for us, as a where we're a marketplace seller, we have control over how much inventory to right. send in and, and pricing. Um, it gives us the ability to apply some subjective judgment and say, boy, this is looking good. The sales rates are really ticking up. The reviews are coming in. They're all positive. And, you know, and that we really uh, make some kind of aggressive, risky moves uh, and keep that product in stock and and keep that momentum. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the name of the, the book uh, that we just had come out this month is Flywheels and Feedback Loops, uh, you know, Guide to Success for Amazon Sellers. And that flywheel concept um, is such an important concept. E even Amazon people internally, you know, talk about the Amazon flywheel. Yeah. And a really critical element to that is uh, that when you've got a success, you've got to stay in stock. Right. That is huge. How often do you release new products? Uh, we try to release uh, between two and four new products a month. Actually, that's a lot. Uh, it is a lot when the you know each product is unique. They're all under the pluggable brand. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into each one. Um, you know, so so but that's our that's our metric. That's what we try to shoot for. How do you decide what to what the next product will be? And what's your yeah, brainstorming you know, process? We're, you know, we're probably a little bit different in a way that's instructive. Uh, you know, I, I, I loved on your, uh, you know, on this podcast series, James Thompson, who, by the way, is not a relative at all, even though we share a similar last Different name. Different spelling. Different yeah. spelling. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no, you know, he's a long lost cousin. But, <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, he, he, he lost a piece. E-commerce. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, he, he kind of was uh, focusing on... Um, you know, more of the scenario of being nimble about your product line, he, he, you know, in his podcast. He, right. And, it, and he's absolutely right. You know, he was talking about you can't fall in love with your products. You've got to be willing to kind of shift your product line with the with the kind of shifting market forces. Yeah. You know, so so interestingly, interestingly, in contrast, we don't have that philosophy. Um, we're pluggable. We connect this with that. So we have a very flexible brand. But, you know, I, I, I used to be a, a developer of device drivers for USB and Bluetooth, uh, right. some of these core technologies that are how we connect everything to everything nowadays. So our goal is a little bit different. We actually want to have a complete product line. We, you know, our goal is to say that, oh, you know, I just got a new laptop that has a USB-C connector. How do I connect an Ethernet cable into that thing? Oh, I'll go look at Pluggable because they probably have it. Mm. 
you know, so, so for like a one stop shop type of thing. Exactly. You know, and that's very powerful if you can do that, even for a like kind of a more narrow, more niche space, mm -hmm. because you get a lot of kind of cross selling. You know, your brand carries a, more than it's more than like a one product thing. The brand carries you across products. So, so when we're doing, you know, deciding on what products to do, you know, we're looking at filling out gaps in our product line, and we're looking at where is where is the technology landscape changing and new needs popping up, and we're trying to get there and fill those needs earlier. You know, for example, we we have a, a dock today, uh, again a USB C dock uh, that's called the Pluggable Triple Display Docking Station. So we first did it as a Kickstarter hmm. to get it off the ground. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and and uh, you know and now today it's it's uh, you know, one of the top selling USB C docks in the market within the top five globally, oh. um, and uh, so we were very early on on that product. Why did you uh, decide to go Kickstarter? I think know, I remember. Did you create something that was like an early version of Kickstarter? You know, I I did create something was that like was Kickstarter like. -source. Exactly. source Yeah. Yeah. Cosource.com. Yeah. We we can we can talk about that. Too, because it was very similar in some ways to to Kickstarter, but yeah, I mean, you know, we when we're looking at something that is very new that the market hasn't seen a product like that before, right. Kickstarter does two things for us. I mean, one is it it it, it attracts an audience, yeah. you know, the of people who want that thing and who are willing to pay for that thing. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, it just generally drives awareness that, hey, that sort of thing's possible and, yeah. and there's going to be products coming that do that sort of thing. Um, so both the market education and actually, you know, pre-selling a lot of units, uh, you know, make Kickstarter a smart thing to do if you've got yeah. something that is, um, you know, kind of groundbreaking in some way. Is it, how do you drive traffic and eyeballs to the Kickstarter? Yeah, well, we've struggled with that. It's in not fact, easy it's, to do. I mean, I've talked it's to not people who are successful do. on it, and it's, it's, it's serious work. Well, and I'll tell you a funny thing. You know, I just said we did a Kickstarter for this triple display docking station. We did it for these reasons. The product's a success. The Kickstarter didn't get funded. Oh, we really? didn't hit our target. Yeah. So, so in fact, uh, we did a lot of a lot of publicity for that, um, and uh, we got yeah I don't know like two thirds of the way to our, our funding goal, but didn't hit it. And it turned out okay for us because you know we had all these people who were interested, and so then just you know six or nine months later, when the product hit the regular market, right. those a yeah. high percentage of those people actually bought the product anyway. Yeah, I mean, there's a um, difference because a lot of those people I don't know some of the people on Kickstarter. They're really they don't have the the resources of yes like the I mean you have the resources and the, and the the know how to actually produce that um, yes so they were pretty much guaranteed they were going to get something but some people probably gets funded they don't get anything for a long time or maybe never yeah 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 exactly no there, there's there's a lot of healthy skepticism now on Kickstarter as there should be uh, yeah and so it's an interesting you know kind of dilemma you know you. In some ways, what's so beautiful about Kickstarter is you can be somebody with no resources, and then Kickstarter gives you the resources because it, yeah. it gives you, you know, all these pre-buyers. On the other hand, you know, it is it's hard. It is hard to produce a device like a triple yeah. display USB-C docking station that is first in the market that you're Sing beating the with Dell is hard Nova. enough. Yeah. <laughs> And so, you know, you, you actually don't want somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, who doesn't, you know, have the resources. Right. So, yeah. Uh, what would you have done differently? Would you have set a lower goal amount or would you have not changed anything? Yeah, that's that's interesting. I think um, it, if I would have changed anything, it would have actually been to... Um, cosmetically target the product more to the Mac audience, hmm. and it's a very specific thing related That's to that. Interesting, product. but but a lot of the there's there's a high correlation between Mac users and Kickstarter types. I mean, you're, you're they're early you're, adopter yeah. type of people. Yeah, and, and, but Mac users they want something that looks Mac, uh, and you know, and ours is you know kind of the 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 more it looks more PC. You know, it's it's a black. <laughs> Thing as opposed to a metal thing, you know, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, so that's interesting. Something I would have changed. So, how did you get pluggable, the domain? Yeah, that's you know, a, that's actually, a really good domain. It's a good domain. Now, you know, it is pluggable with one G, so it is a misspelled word okay. that, that makes it a little easier. But uh, 
Yeah, you know, it's actually it actually goes the whole way back to IBM. Uh, so so mid '90s, I'm sitting there at IBM. I'm working on OS2 as a software developer, working on the operating system. And um, you know, there's a lot of people around. Uh, we're in Boca Raton, Florida, the birthplace of the IBM PC. There's a lot of people around who are involved with that. And um, you know, and and we spend our days like plugging stuff in and out of computers. You know, popping open the cases, shoving right. in things having to deal with the difference, you know, between ISA and uh, microchannel and, and, uh, you know, uh, way ATP. too much about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so I was thinking about, you know, boy, it'd be nice if, you know, the, the computer was just a small box and everything, you know, kind of just plugged into it externally, you know, that, that everything was more just pluggable. And I think that that sat with me for a while. And um, so then I, I got the domain name, I don't know, you know, probably about, eight years before I started the company. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, so, so how prob- much was it at the time? To, oh, uh, just domain. nobody had it. Right, I mean, yeah. but it weren't, weren't it more expensive at that time than now? I mean, well, two, now it's like $3 for the first year or something. Was it more expensive then or? Yeah. No, uh, it wasn't. It, it, was, it was roughly the same. Prices okay. have gone up a little bit for domain names. Yeah. So how did you start Pluggable? So you had the domain eight years prior, then when do you actually start it? Yeah, so then I actually started in 2009. So I'm working at a at a chip company called DisplayLink that does USB graphics chips, and um, you know I really looked out across our customers at DisplayLink, and and that was DisplayLink was a technology that was really exciting. I mean, you, you know that that I could just start plugging in adapters and extra monitors into my PC and have four or six or eight monitors. Um, uh, today because I love more. How many monitors do you use that on your computer? I actually only use three. I use okay. three. So yeah, the main a, one and two externals. Yep. Okay. Yep. It's a really nice setup. You know, typically we'll have you know email up on one, d- a document that I'm you know maybe editing on another, and then just a browser on another with other information. Okay. So you know, I I, sure. I like to know I, that I, geeky I, stuff. I like of what. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're a programmer, if you're working with spreadsheets or stuff, it is a pain to be sitting on a single dis- uh, screen. Right. Uh, I, I, uh, I always want to have multiple displays. So, so great technology from DisplayLink, but, um, you know, it's troublesome. Um, you know, there, there was a lot of uh, stuff that could go wrong. And the companies that were selling the actual adapters and things um, really weren't set up to help customers through all that. And uh, so I thought, God, you know, I'd like to build a better device company. And, and that is, you know, our kind of founding motto. And we still really use it to this day, right. um, focused on um, understanding the technology better, explaining it better and supporting it better. Um, and because I worked at, you know, a chip company and I was dealing with this whole supply chain, uh, this global supply chain of manufacturing electronics, uh, and I'd done software development on device drivers, I kind of knew the people involved and and the companies involved, and so yeah. we were actually the, the goal when I when I left DisplayLink in August of two thousand nine was to have a first product on the market on sale on Amazon within a month, yeah. and at that time that seemed crazy. Um, you know, uh, today it, people understand that that's actually quite doable, uh, but in fact we did hit that uh, and we you know got our first docking station. What was the station. first product? It was a USB 2 docking station, but we didn't call it a docking station. We were actually targeting a unique scenario of USB thin clients. So so I was actually taking kind of an off-the-shelf piece of hardware and tailoring it for a different purpose of being able to have a single PC and connect in a bunch of these USB docking stations and have each one be an individual terminal kind of for the school market. Hmm. And uh, if you go back uh, to 2009 and look at our YouTube videos. I spoke at conferences about this and, and it was really kind of exciting stuff. Interestingly, we left that market probably about three or four years ago. It mm. just didn't, didn't work out as a market, the, the USB thin client market. So, so uh, yeah, the, those kind of dilemmas of, you know, do I go deep and really kind of work hard on something and bet on something or do I go wide and, and spread my bets? You know, I, I'm, I'm definitely an advocate of, um, you know, minimal viable products and uh, right. think of yourself as so you're as like a, a programmer a of software yeah that's the methodology of probably a lot of software engineers right yep yep yeah that's right so your first order yeah what do you do for your first order so for the first order uh god i 
I, nobody's asked me this. Um, you know, we took a piece of hardware because we were ordering such small quantity. Um, you know, we couldn't even uh, have it be customized in terms of silk screening and packaging. So for the first order, and I don't remember even who it went to, um, and there weren't that many orders those first two or three Wait, months. You don't, obviously, at the time, they don't have like FBA. You're like shipping them all yourself or? No, I started right at the time where FBA was, oh, okay. was available. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> I think I might have shipped the first order myself, but, but real quickly after that, uh, I was stocking FBA. FBA was new at that time. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically, I had a bunch of stickers and I just put a sticker on the product and a UPC sticker on the box. Um, and otherwise, it was this generic product. Oh, and, and put uh, documentation in that was, you know, taking this product that was originally designed for one purpose and the documentation was all about how to use it for this other purpose. Um, yeah. How soon after do you release another product then? So the first three or four months, that 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 first product was selling, but selling pretty poorly. Um, and uh, I actually had this conversation with with a friend of mine who I trust quite a bit, and and said, you know, gosh, should I stick with this and and just try to make this work with these USB thin clients, or should I, you know, spread my bets more? Yeah. And um, you know, everybody, which a lot of people me. are asking themselves right now, probably, you know, the same question. Yeah, 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 it's a really important question, and everybody I asked gave gave the same answer, which one was, person. "You are one person. You got to focus. If you mm. don't focus, you'll get nothing done." Mm. And 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 in a lot of things in life, that actually is pretty good advice. Although I, I do think a little bit of spreading your bets is good, even you know, even when you're trying to, you know, in, in deep, other things. Yeah. But but I, it definitely in this case, I decided, okay, well, you know, the evidence so far is kind of weak on this USB thin client stuff. And, you know, pluggable as a brand and as a vision is bigger than this. I need to go wide now. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was about four or five months later that I launched the second product. And then by the end of that year, uh, probably had eight or nine products. Okay. And, you know, today we have about 120 products. Was it a tough leap for you going from display link to then actually manufacturing and producing your own product and brand? What um, was your thought process you know, I, at the time of, you know, leaving DisplayLink? You know, the thing that I still do not know how to, the, to do to this day is sell. Um, you know, I'm not a sales guy. So, uh, you know, that's what scared me. And, and so this thing where Amazon would sell for me, uh, was like, okay, take my greatest weakness and take it away from me. Yes. Um, <laughs> a lot of other things about running businesses I had done. I mean, um, you know, it, it, we talked about the tax stuff earlier. Actually, accounting is really important. Um, you know, so, you know, how to set up a corporation, you know, yeah. how to how to not get in trouble, you know, and, and get behind in your, your early yeah. tax filings. I mean, you, you founded know, you, and sold CoSource, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that other almost Kickstarter like business. Yeah, so that was yeah, that was ten years prior. You know, that that was nineteen ninety nine and two thousand, where we had a a market for open source software where people could uh, identify that you know, gosh, I'd really like this device driver to exist for this thing on Linux, or I really wish this bug would get fixed you were in really Firefox. Early. Yeah, yeah, and they could they could say you know if somebody would fix that bug in Firefox, you know, I'd pay five bucks. And another guy comes along and says, you know, I'd pay 50 bucks. And then, you know, maybe IBM comes along and says, oh, we'll contribute 500. And then on the other side, you get bids from developers to say, oh, I'll, I'll fix that bug for 2000. And so then the, you know, the, the uh, kind of commitments to pay for that work keep going up and the bids keep coming in, maybe lower and lower from developers to do the work. And then when you finally have a match, mm. Uh, you've got a project and the work gets done. So that was CoSource.com. And, and uh, so so it is, it is not Kickstarter. It's very different in a lot of ways. But that whole kind of concept of aggregating together demand to make something right. new happen, right. you know, very similar that way. And that was 10 years, uh, 10 years prior to starting Pluggable. That was 1999. So when you, you branch out, you go from 1 to 2 to 9 to 10, um, one thing we talked about, before is so how do you compete with the big guys there's big big players in this space yeah yeah you know i i think um so we one of the things that we had to do was develop a lot of software to automate things um because we needed to be lean not have a lot of employees 
um, and be very on the ball. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, right from the get go, uh, kind of within a year of, of starting Pluggable, you know, I had software to send out an email after every order shipped that, that said, hey, you know, if you have any problem at all, just reply back to this email. We'll be able to help you. I mean, that was super critical because we didn't have a call center. You know, I didn't, I, I mean, I intentionally didn't want to go down that route of having, yeah. you know, all of these like low paid people, people sitting, yeah, sitting phone. there on the phone, high turnover rate, you know, don't really know what they're doing or they're in India and they're totally disconnected from the product. I didn't want any of that. So I was the one supporting the product for the first like two years. Um, and so I had to make it easy, but manageable for people to contact me. So you know, s sending out email after every order. Hey, if you have any trouble, contact us. And you know, if you if you do something interesting with this product or you have a great experience, I'd love to. You know, if you'd write that up in an Amazon review, uh, and really encouraging reviews, not just in terms of just positive reviews, but reviews that are substantive, that really kind of say something interesting about the product. I mean, Amazon is pretty limiting in terms of what we can say, or I guess how much we can say about the product. Um, it's gotten a little bit better now with um, A plus content, which has become available now to, to third party sellers. But really the, for even today, the Amazon reviews is where a lot of the meat is of, you know, has anybody really used my Dell, in a Dell XPS, you know, 6550 with this? Well, the only place you're probably gonna find that is in an Amazon review. So. Um, you know, we really focused on, on trying to make the reviews both get as many of them as possible, but also make them substantive so that they were really a learning tool about the products. Mm -hmm. uh, and that required a lot of automation. So we yeah, developed all that automate? automation. Yeah. We, you know, we, we tried to think of every little touch point where, you know, something was happening that we could encourage the next step. Um, and, and we thought about it in terms of two kind of ways. There was positive things that were happening, that like there was evidence that the customer was having a good experience, and we wanted those customers to write reviews. And then there was evidence of bad things happening, and we wanted to those yeah. customers to get in touch with us yeah. so we could help. That's part so, of the book, actually, that stuck out. I mean, there were a couple um, sections that I flagged for myself um, with the flywheels and, you know, flywheels and feedback loops, and one of them was handling negative reviews. Um, yes. So I want you to keep going on that, but could you pause for a moment and talk about that handling the, the negative review since you just mentioned it? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's super important. It's kind of crazy because, you know, Amazon, out of a sense of protectiveness, you know, doesn't tell you when there's a negative review on your product. I mean, they don't tell you about any reviews. Um, and they don't make it easy for you to reach out and contact that customer, even though, yeah. um, at least for Pluggable, um, a really high percentage of our negative reviews are really calls for help. They're really because they don't understand how to use it. it, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's not just an opinion about the product. They actually had a problem, a problem that we could help solve. And right. so, so yeah, one of the first things we you know we did was write a bunch of software so that we would get an email uh, as soon as a review went up on the product. And we would connect that back to the customer order that that, um, that, that review came from yeah. so that we could reach out and contact that customer. Yeah. And, um, and so um, you know, we did that initially kind of for ourselves and as a competitive advantage for ourselves uh, and a lot of other software. And eventually it became so much uh, to maintain that I, you know, I actually have a, a kind of a whole separate team here that does all that software development. Um, that we really faced a choice of, okay, well, we won't be able to continue investing in this unless we can spread the cost among right. more sellers than just us. Right. And why, you know, have such a amazing set of software when only one seller is benefiting from it? It, you know, it, it was it was kind of clear what we needed to try to do, which was offer this the same software, the same advantage to other sellers, you know, and sell it so that we could, you know, amortize our our cost of software development across more sellers. And so we, we spun off a separate business called Efficient Era, um, and, and this book kind of you know talks through what we do uh, with the Efficient Era software, but basically everything that we did to make Pluggable successful, we're now offering to others at EfficientEra.com. What are some of the best practices? How do you handle negative reviews and turn them around? You know, I think the, the big thing is that if it is a, a customer review that is basically a customer service request, that you treat it as such. Um, you know, there's a lot of people, I, I see a lot of really bad advice about negative reviews yeah. in terms of... What have you heard you know, that's bad? Yeah. 
Well, you know, the, the, the kind of begging or, or, you know, when you're not offering anything back in terms of um, speaking to what they wrote the negative review yeah. about. Like someone wrote it and maybe they offer them a discount, but that's not what they're asking. They're asking, they're having problems using it or something like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The, those strategies, you know, generally will not work. I mean, you know, people are aware of the, you know, most people are aware of how the Amazon review system works. Um, you know, they're not going to be swayed by anything other than, you know, oh my God, the, the company reached out to me and, and the problem I was complaining about, they actually solved it. I mean, most people, if they write a negative review about your product and you're actually able to solve the thing that triggered, you know, their, their bad experience, right. you know, most people will update that review to say, and sometimes they'll do it where they leave behind the old and then they give an update or whatever, you know, but most people will say, gosh, you know. They, they solved it. This is awesome. And in fact, you know, we have a lot of one star reviews that turn into five star reviews be, uh, that yeah. basically say something like, you know, it didn't work at first, but then pluggable was awesome. This is the best company ever. Five star. And, and um, so, I, so I think the, the biggest thing is it's all about the customer and it's all about, um, you know, doing right by them. Um, and then you know, you can exert pressure or, or give opportunities, you know, to change feedback or submit feedback. But but in the end, that's all got to be very light and gentle and respectful. Mm -hmm. um, it's really all about the experiences, you know, creating yeah. good experiences up front. And if somebody does unfortunately have a negative experience, you know, treating that as, as a customer service incident and doing right by yeah. them. Yeah. And so, so, Bernie, you were talking about the automation. So the emails for positive negative reviews, what else did you automate so that you can compete with the big, big guys? You know, uh, there's, there's other things that occur on Amazon that Amazon won't tell you about, or they'll tell you about and they won't connect the dots. <clears throat> um, one connect the dot thing is, um, there's a way to tell, uh, a way to receive an email right away when a return is triggered very, very early in the process. Uh, it, it's actually kind of on by, by default. Well, the usual order of events is somebody has a bad experience, they're really frustrated, they go, I'm gonna return this thing. Um, but they, they won't write the negative review just yet because they actually wanna get their money back <laughs> before they go slam this company you know, with the negative review. So you have this little window of time. Mm. If you can you know, treat that as, a, as an event that you respond to very quickly, mm. you know, bo both with automation and with human beings yeah. to back it up, that's that that reach out and say so so we so our software provides a way to reach out to every one of those returns and say you know we're very sorry you know that that you returned the product you had a bad experience um can you say a little bit about what happened you know we'd like to help and we get a pretty high response rate to that where people say oh man you know i plugged it in and it just didn't work it looks like it's doa uh, and then, you know, we have this great customer service process that's really specific to Pluggable where we say, you know, well, you know, just just run this tool and, and uh, we'll see what we can see about what, what happened. And we'll be able to see exactly what mm. went wrong. You know, was it a device driver thing? You know, did, does it appear to be dead hardware? You know, did it even power up and, and ever, was it ever visible to the computer? And, uh, you know, a really high percent of the time we'll be able to figure out. Oh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm sorry. You you connected a network adapter and you didn't have Wi-Fi on at the time, so the computer couldn't get the Windows updates. Yeah, you have a really tough product. I mean, someone yeah. has to really know what they're doing. Yeah, and I, I think it's good for every, you know, everybody who's thinking of selling on Amazon, yeah. not necessarily to find tough products, but to find it something that they have a special. There's a barrier of entry for. type of. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think if you're purely selling, if you're selling socks, you better love socks and you better <laughs> right. know some things about people's frustration points and people's desires when it comes to socks. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you do, you can build out a sock line and you can sell it on Amazon and you'll do well, uh, you know, as long as long as you kind of, you know, apply all these best practices. So reaching out to, that's a great suggestion uh, i i bet most people are not doing that i would say R you yeah. know reaching out as soon as they something is triggered with a return maybe i'm wrong yeah. um what else have, did you automate that has helped compete with the big big guys um you know so we uh 
Well, one thing we've automated, we talked about tax and regulatory. In Europe, it's a customer expectation that if they're a business, they can get a bad invoice uh, for every order. And believe it or not, at least at this moment, Amazon doesn't do it. Uh, Amazon's working working on some stuff there. But uh, so we have a system that automatically sends VAT invoices for all the uh, orders in Europe. Um, you know, another thing is, uh, and this is kind of in a, in a different area, but we talked earlier about the key, the, the key thing of staying in stock so you can keep the flywheel moving. Well, you know, Amazon has a lot of great reports that will tell you kind of what's happening with your inventory and what's happening at your sales rate at this moment in time. But they don't provide a lot of tools that on a per product basis put that in perspective. Right. So we've got this really great sales charting where we basically are, are gathering all your reports every day and then um, charting them out with a, with kind of historical sales and uh, historical inventory levels. And then we're detecting lots of events that are occurring with those products out of stock, a change in price, price up or price down, uh, you know, other other kind of events with the product. So when I'm going and I'm making one of those tough, risky decisions of, you know, I've only ever ordered a thousand of this before. Is it time to order 3000? I can go back and look at that sales chart and really have good perspective on, is this a product that's trending up and, and are kind of the stars aligning where we've got a bunch of positive events lining up and sales are ticking up? I can't see that just by looking at the data at one snapshot in time, you know, but I can totally see it if I see all the sales data and all the related events all in perspective. And I and I go to those charts every time I'm placing an order that's, you know, kind of well, really almost every time I place any order, but certainly the ones that are non-routine. Mm -hmm. There was another um, section that struck me, Bernie, which was the high conversion section. Yep. So everyone wants to convert, have higher conversion. Yep. So what do you recommend for that? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, it is, uh, as, uh, you know, in the other podcast, James said, you know, it's really important to realize that, that Amazon is looking at metrics like conversion rate to decide whether to spin up your flywheel. Um, if you've got a poor converting product, if Amazon is sending people your way and those people aren't buying, right. um, Amazon will use that as a signal to not send as many people your way anymore. Um, so, you know, I, I think it is, and there's a lot of bad advice out there. In interestingly, I think one of the, and this is a bit of a, a controversial opinion, I think, yeah. but, you know, I think that it's, it's actually uh, bad advice to use auto campaigns in advertising where basically you're letting Amazon pick a lot of wild, crazy keywords. And then, and then that algorithm will, you know, take the better performing ones and, and throw more impressions at it. And, and, it can be a good way of, of learning, you know, what keywords are relevant for your product if you must do that. Like you you wouldn't have known otherwise type of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But if you would have known otherwise, I think you're better off starting with what you believe are the best keywords right. that are already high converting and then just evolve from there. You know, try some new ones that are that are on the periphery, you know, get rid of some ones that have that have uh, turned out to be poor converting. So, so rather than let an AI or let an algorithm start from nothing on your product, I, you know, I think you're better off starting somewhere at your best judgment and then evolving from there. Hmm. How do you decide, because this is a competitive advantage, right? You have this internal software, you're giving it to other people. I mean, you could have yep. another, you know, USB company use your service. Were yep. you ever, and I know Amazon sellers from what I've um, learned, they can be private about what they're doing. Um, yep. So what was the decision to actually, you know, release? Okay, yeah, like you can offset the cost, but then you have these competitors or someone else. Maybe that didn't enter in your mind at all. I don't know. Oh, no, no, it totally did. I mean, it, it, it probably delayed us releasing the software for others for probably about two years. Um, oh, torturing over this decision because it, it, this offers a huge competitive advantage for right. us. Um, and and we knew that we would get some electronic sellers. And in fact, you know, right now we have uh, you know over two hundred companies you know using Efficient Era, about uh, around fifty using it on a daily basis or regularly. Um, and uh, you know, and some of those are electronics companies yeah. or, or have chunks of their product line that overlap our our business. Um, 
you know, and I'm worried about it both directions. I'm worried about us getting beat with our own tools. And I also worried that, you know, because we sell on Amazon that, that we would not be able to attract electronic sellers. You know, but right, I, I, because I, they can look at it like as a privacy thing too. Well, yeah, they're going to have yep. my data. Yep. And How so do you we, get around we, that when you talk to them? Yeah, you know, so there's there's two things about it. I mean, one is that, is that the universe of sellers is really big and the set of categories is really big. So there are just, you know, most sellers are not electronic sellers. In fact, you know, 95% of sellers or 99% are not electronics. Even though electronics is a really big category, it's a pretty brutal category and you tend to have mostly big sellers there. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing is that, that most of the market is non-competitive. Um, but then, you know, the other thing, so for the set, for the other sellers is we've been very strict about our privacy policy and about how we treat the data. We basically are very careful to say that all of your data is is yours and is protected and we talk about how it's protected um, and we do carve off one little chunk of data that we want to aggregate the the learnings from it across all sellers and that has actually keyword data um, so in our in our user agreement we carve off keyword data as one where we're actually going to use all of our keyword data all of us and apply those learnings for all of us um, but everything else, we're, we're very, very strict about it. Um, yeah, you know, and, I can see I that being a tough decision. You know. Yeah, it was a tough decision for us. I mean, you know, we, we uh, you know, it wanted to, you know, I did for probably two years keep it as a competitive advantage just for pluggable. Yeah. Um, and uh, but it, but in the end, it was that. Um, things are getting more and more sophisticated on Amazon. Actually, this keyword stuff, we're, we're just rolling out a lot of these keyword features. We, we have a new feature on efficientera.com that's rolling out this coming month where we uh, are pulling in all the Amazon advertising reports and showing you ex on a per SKU basis in a way that Amazon doesn't show you exactly how your advertising spend is leading to sales or not and charting that over time. And uh, so... But, but a lot of this is a lot of software development work to do it. And we really got to the point where to do everything we needed to do to be successful, we couldn't keep it to ourselves anymore. We, we, we needed to make this a standalone tool that, that had a life of its own. And that's what, that's what we've done. What's the most popular portion of Efficient Era? You know, it, it's probably uh, our review to buyer matching. Um, what is that? Yeah, because I see there's buyer <laughs> review matching, there's email automation, there's seller feedback, VAT invoice automation, sales charts, category ranking, keywords, and a lot more. So yep. the buyer review matching is the most popular. The, the number one reason why people come to us is they've got one or, or a whole bunch of one star or negative reviews. And Amazon does not provide any way to know what order those came from or who that customer is. We actually pull all this data together and connect the dots and figure out which uh, orders go with which um, with which reviews. And that is what enables you because if you if you don't do that, you have no way to contact that customer except with a comment in the review. But a comment in the review is not the right scenario to do customer service. You know, it's out in public. The reviewer actually most of the time will not even receive a notification that you posted up there. It's kind of like, you know, you can give a you can give a, a kind of a, a response, but you're not going to have an interaction there. Right. The only way to, to really have it be a customer service interaction is to be able to email them directly. Um, and you, if you know uh, what order the thing came from, then Amazon does provide a way for you to contact the customer directly. So Amazon does not connect up reviews and orders, uh, but we, you know, dig through a whole bunch of data uh, and and do that for you. Mm -hmm. So when that negative review gets posted, you get an email that basically says, hey, you got a one star review and here's the link to the order that it came from. And mm -hmm. you can just click on that link and, and go contact that customer and say, sorry, you know, uh, you know, we'd like to help. You know, Bernie, I want to talk about another section of the book, but um, I, I want to ask, you know, we talk a lot about Amazon. What advice do you give people when they're asking you, what should I do about multi-channel or other channels? What What do you tell them? Yeah, I mean, when, you, when you're our size, you got to do it. I mean, we distribute through the biggest electronics distributor in the country. We sell on Walmart, on eBay, on Newegg. Um, 
But I tell you what, Amazon's been eating everybody's lunch the last yeah. few years. And so as much as I think everybody, you know, really wants and needs diversification of their revenue streams so that they're not dependent on one company, you know, that that can kind of turn off the spigot at any time, frankly, right. um, and, and does and does, um, you know, but uh, they're winning right now. And, uh, you know, we, we've done all those channels and, you know, uh, we've we've put our full effort into it and uh you know amazon is still mm. dominant i would think new egg would be big for for that category it's you know it's a lot electronic specialist uh yeah. new egg is you know but if you you know compare with amazon uh you know amazon at this point Just in the, the united states of traffic yeah so much mind share and prime and you know and all that stuff i mean yeah i mean there, i've got a lot of buddies who are geeks like me you know who you know Maybe do order off Newegg occasionally, but you know, ten years ago they ordered off Newegg all the time, uh, and today more and more, mm. you know, it's off of Amazon. It's interesting. Yeah. So in the flywheels and feedback loops, um, there's also a section on tools. So I'm yes. interested in tools, software. What things do you recommend uh, for people to check out? Yeah, you know, the, the the book is really kind of explaining how, without playing any games, uh, by kind of doing the right thing for customers you can be successful on Amazon. And, and our tools are centered around that. And so the book, you know, first and foremost, is a kind of a, a full explanation of all the things that would lead you to do things our way. It doesn't actually spend a lot of time talking about our tools, but it's the kind of philosophy that leads you to create the kind of tools that we have. Right. So, right. so, so I have to say efficientera.com. That's the, right. the, you know, the most important thing. And we have this kind of broad set of tools. Um, you know, in, in terms of other tools, it's actually interesting. I mean, I think because of who we are, we don't use a ton of other tools. Um, you know, I have loved the auto MCF tool. We talked about the other channels there uh, and the ability to, you know, um, you know, serve Newegg and eBay. Well, one of the things that we try to do right from the get go is um, keep our supply chain simple and also not have to have a warehouse ourselves. Right. Well, the only way really to achieve that would be as if we could fulfill our eBay and Newegg and other orders out of Amazon FBA. Right. Um, and uh, there's been for a long time this great tool, which is part of a, another suite called Auto MCF. It's functionality that we currently don't do at Efficient Era. And, uh, you know, we use that all the time to, you know, fulfill our other uh, non-Amazon orders. Um, yeah. Any other, like, um, off Amazon things like email or software that you use internally with the team? You know, um, we send all the emails directly. I think uh, a big thing, uh, if you're going to be a business like us, that's kind of obvious, but some people don't do it, is have a ticketing system. Mm -hmm. uh, we use a ticketing system called Zendesk. Mm -hmm. it, it's one of the bigger ones. It's pretty good. There's a lot of ticketing systems out there. <clears throat> um, but, uh, you know, it's so important uh, in today's world, especially on, on Amazon where reviews are so important, um, that you don't, that you treat every customer interaction as critical, um, that you don't drop them, yeah. um, that you have an ability to have a relatively small team that is able to have kind of waves of customer support requests come in uh, and that you, even though you might not be able to take care of all of them in that one hour, you can take care of all of them in that one day or so. And a ticketing system gives you all those ability, you know, to allocate out the issues and make sure that there's one person assigned to, to to run it to ground and solve it, and also to handle those bubbles throughout the day, uh, and and know uh, you know that you've taken care of everything you know roughly yeah. within a, you know, kind of a twenty four hour time frame, which is what we shoot for. Yeah. So, Bernie, I'm going to have you um, talk about whatever advice or story you think is most impactful. But before I have you do that. I want people that you know should check out efficientera.com and they can check out pluggable.com with one G. And um, I want you to tell that you climbed Mount St. Helen in a in a floral dress. So I, I left myself hanging because I don't even know the story. <laughs> and then we'll talk so, about your closing advice. But 
So, so you know, I, I live here in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. I mean, this is an awesome area, great mountains here. And so, you know, one of the things I, I love to do and a lot of people here love to do is hike. Um, so I'm, if, if I'm not here in the office on the weekend or, or with family, chances are I'm up on a mountain somewhere. So there's this great tradition around here uh, that on Mother's Day every year, okay. uh, which is kind of right at the end of the season where it's easy to get permits to climb Mount St. Helens, we get big groups of people to climb Mount St. Helens on Mother's Day. Well, you know, what we do is we all get into dresses in celebrations of our mom, in celebration of our moms. And uh, so, you know, last year I got this beautiful Hawaiian floral dress. It was awesome. <laughs> right, that's going to uh, be your profile pic of this interview. That you oh, guys, is it? No, oh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> We got it. We got it. If you want, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was fun climbing Mount St. Helens in a dress. Although we had, we had probably uh, forty or sixty mile an hour winds coming down off the mountain in the morning, and the dress was kind of a sail. I mean, I, I was, I was tra climbing along these ridge lines. You can empathize and, now. Yeah, I almost yeah. got swept off the mountain with, with my <laughs> sail and the dress. <laughs> so, what's your final advice? What, what lessons do you want to talk about that would be important for? you know, e-commerce sellers? Yeah, you know, I think that the important thing is it's easier today to start a company and create something unique, create something valuable. Um, and unique doesn't mean it has to be completely unique. It means that you're just doing a few things better and to take that product and reach markets with it and be able to build a viable business with it. You know, whether you are somebody who is just trying to do it just for yourself, you just want financial freedom, you just want time freedom, great. Or if you're somebody who has this bigger vision of building a, a product company that has a, a brand and a whole line of products and, and takes on the big guys, all of that is much easier today than it than it ever was in, in, in the past and certainly easier than it was 10 or 20 years ago. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, these, these marketplaces, Amazon being in the lead, that let you outsource your sales, your marketing, your logistics and reach a global audience. So, so you know, my advice if you're, you know, sitting there at a desk job and, and um, you're unhappy, um, but you have things in life where you've seen people be frustrated or you've seen people have unmet needs and you know how to solve them with a product, you know, this is the time to go do it. Uh, Cause uh, you know, you, you, and it's not just on the, you know, delivery side of, of the Amazon side. It's also on the supply side of you've got a global supply chain that is willing to work with relatively small companies and produce products for them. And you've got the digital manufacturing revolution that's coming yeah. at us very fast, um, you know, where you can, you know, design these products digitally and have them manufactured even as one-offs. Mm -hmm. company I love to mention, a U.S. company here called Proto Labs. Um, you know, if you're, you know, designing a product that is, you know, mechanically relatively simple, it's just a few parts, but, mm -hmm. it, but they can be very complex parts. Um, Proto Labs can, you know, have them be made for you in in, in ones or in one thousand unit mm, quantities cool. out, out of plastic or metal or a whole bunch of other materials. So, so we're really entering a new world where, um, you know, small guys, you know, the small companies, um, uh, anyone uh, can go start a product company uh, and do things that only the big guys were able to do before. What other shows do you like to go to? So Prosper Show, where else? Yeah, Prosper Show. You know, I actually, you know, it's, I like the oldie show of uh, SCO, uh, the Sellers Conference for Online Entrepreneurs, or in, in a, they're doing a renaming this year. Uh, that's a, another good one. Uh, you know, in my world, electronics, you know, I, I've got to go to Asia a lot for shows, to Hong Kong, uh, and, and then here in the U.S., the Consumer Electronics Show, mm -hmm. uh, National Association of Broadcasters Show. Um, but, uh, some industry ones and specific e-commerce ones too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Bernie, thank you. I really appreciate your time. Everyone should check out efficientera.com and pluggable.com. I look forward to seeing you at Prosper Show. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you. Thanks so much, Jerry. Thanks, Bernie. Yep, bye. All right, so let's see what, I always like to see what the book looks like. I've seen it, so hold it up for a second. Okay, so here's the book, Flywheels and Feedback Loops, A Guide for Success for Amazon Sellers. 
Cool. And so it, it's uh, you know it's about 130 pages, but it's we tried to make it fun. It's it's not as you know it's not one of those dry books. At least I hope not. And so you have some equipment uh, around some of your products. I, yeah, actually. So so you know I'm I'm using a pluggable mic right here, which is our uh, USB Vox. It's a great kind of studio microphone. Hmm. And then you know so that you know we don't have any echo effect. I'm actually getting my audio. I'm hearing you in a set of Bluetooth uh, uh, headset oh. here. So, this is our BTHS Flex. Oh, so that so Bluetooth is, a, is around there. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So it's one of these collared headsets. It's really, I, I love these What's things. What's your favorite product that you have at Pluggable? Well, you know, our, our top seller are the docking stations. And I love those because you can get multiple monitors, you know, off any PC. Um, it, you know, in addition to, you know, now with USB-C, you can charge your laptop. It's basically a single cable to your laptop and you get all the connectivity you want. But actually, out of the consumer products, it's actually this one that I'm wearing. I mean, mm -hmm. this, this, this Bluetooth headset, we, we've been able to do two things that are, that are really unique. I mean, first of all, the collared headset, there's not a ton of them out there. This one's a great one. Uh, the other thing is we were able to uh, leap ahead a generation in the chip that's inside here. There's a chip inside here from Cambridge Silicon Radio, CSR. Um, it's the latest generation. It has, a, it has several great new features, including equalization. Um, and the, the price that we were able to get these produced at was awesome. We did a very kind of big batch buy right from the start. This is a product that's unique to us. For a first uh, buy, do you normally, like, okay, we were a thousand or ten thousand or a set amount that you typically buy for a first run? We try to make it as small as possible. I mean, if we can, we get them down to 500, yeah. uh, but a lot of times it's 1,000. This one was unusual because uh, Bluetooth is uh, regulated, basically regulated by the Bluetooth uh, SIG, the, the Bluetooth standards body. Mm. And so to, to legally and, and kind of comply with their trademark licensing, we have to spend about $4,000 just to get their Bluetooth license for a product wow. like this. And just so for one product, just for one product, it's very expensive. Oh there's a gosh. lot of there's a lot of non logoed kind of illegal products on the market, uh, but and the Bluetooth SIG is beginning to you know take action against some of them. But uh, yeah, because we had to spend four thousand dollars in just the licensing for this, it actually pushed up what made sense for our initial uh, purchase and manufacturing of it. Um, so we, we tend to do less Bluetooth products, but when we do them, we go all out. And right. We try to customize Because there's already a big possible. cost involved. Exactly. Yeah. I love it. This is, I don't even know why you're in this business, Bernie. This is, <laughs> there's so, so many fees off the top of this thing. Oh, oh yeah. It's, Someone's it's got tough. to do it, but good for you. <laughs> Electronics is brutal, but we, we've, you know, we're doing brutal. well and we've got great products. Sounds brutal, but thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, look forward to seeing you. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.